In this video, I'm going to read from chapter 18, titled The Origin of Machu Picchu, from the book titled Inca Land, Machu Picchu, Explorations in the Highlands of Peru, by Hiram Bingham, 1922. Some other day, I hope to tell of the work of clearing and excavating Machu Picchu, of the life lived by its citizens, and of the ancient towns, of which it was the most important. At present, I must rest content with the discussion of its probable identity. Here was a powerful citadel, tenable against all odds, a stronghold where a mere handful of defenders could prevent a great army from taking the place by assault. Why should anyone have desired to be so secure from capture as to have built the fortress in such an inaccessible place? The builders were not in search of fields. There is so little arable land here that every square yard of earth had to be terraced in order to provide food for the inhabitants. They were not looking for comfort or convenience. Safety was their primary consideration. They were sufficiently civilized to practice incentive agriculture, sufficiently skillful to equal the best masonry the world has ever seen sufficiently ingenious to make delicate bronzes and sufficiently advanced in art to realize the beauty of simplicity. What could have induced such a people to select this remote fastness of the Andes, with all its disadvantages, as the site for their capital, unless they were fleeing from powerful enemies? The thought will already have occurred to the reader that the Temple of the Three Windows at Machu Picchu fits the words of the native writer who had heard from a child the most ancient traditions and histories, including the story, already quoted from Sir Clements Markham's translation, that Manco Capac, the first Inca, ordered works to be executed at the place of his birth, consisting of a masonry wall with three windows, which were emblems of the house of his fathers, hence he descended. The first window was called Tamputoco, although none of the other chroniclers gives the story of the first Inca ordering a memorial wall to be built at the place of his birth, they nearly all tell of his having come from a place called Tamputoco, an inn or country place remarkable for its windows. The place assigned by all the chroniclers as the location of the traditional Tamputoco, as has been said, is Pacaritampu, about nine miles southwest of Cusco. Pacaritampu has some interesting ruins and caves, but careful examination shows that while there are more than three openings to its caves, there are no windows in its buildings. The buildings of Machu Picchu, on the other hand, have far more windows than any other important ruin in Peru. The climate of Pacaritampu, like that of most places in the highlands, is too severe to invite or encourage the use of windows. The climate of Machu Picchu is mild, consequently the use of windows was natural and agreeable. So far as I know, there is no place in Peru where the ruins consist of anything like a masonry wall with three windows, of such a ceremonial character as is here referred to, except at Machu Picchu. It would certainly seem as though the Temple of the Three Windows, the most significant structure within the citadel, is the building referred to by Pachacuti, Yamkui, Salcamaihua. The principal difficulty with this theory is that while the first meaning of toko in Holguin's standard Quechua dictionary is ventana or window, and while window is the only meaning given in this important word in Markham's revised Quechua dictionary from 1908, a dictionary compiled from many sources, the second meaning of toko given by Holguin is, quote, Alacena, quote, a cupboard set in a wall. Undoubtedly, this means that what we call in the ruins of the houses of the Incas, a niche. Now the drawings, crude as they are, in Sir Clemens Markham's translation of the Salca Maihua manuscript, do give the impression of niches rather than of windows. Does Tampu Toko mean a Tampu remarkable for its niches? At Pacari Tampu, there do not appear to be any particularly niches. While at Machu Picchu, on the other hand, there are many very beautiful niches, especially in the cave which has been referred to as Royal Mausoleum. As a matter of fact, nearly all the finest ruins of the Incas 
have excellent niches. Since niches were so common a feature of Inca architecture, the chances are that Sir Clements is right in translating Salca Maihua as he did and in calling Tamputoko the hill with the three opening windows. In any case, Machu Picchu fits the story far better than does Pacari Tampu. However, in view of the fact that the early writers all repeat the story that Tampu Toko was at Pacari Tampu, it would be absurd to say that they did not know what they were talking about, even though the actual remains at or near Pacari Tampu do not fit the requirements. It would be easier to adopt Pacari Tampu as the site of Tampu Toko were it not for the legal records of an inquiry made by Toledo at the time when he put the last Inca to death. Fifteen Indians, descended from those who used to live near Las Salinas, the important salt works near Cusco, on being questioned, agreed that they heard from their fathers and grandfathers repeat the tradition that when the first Inca, Manco Capac, captured their lands, he came from Tampu Toco. They did not say that the first Inca came from Pacari Tampu, which, it seems to me, would have been the most natural thing for them to have said if this were the general belief of the natives. In addition, there is the still older testimony of some Indians born before the arrival of the first Spaniards, who were examined at a legal investigation in 1570. A chief, aged 92, testified that Manco Capac came out of a cave called Toco, and that he was lord of the town near that cave. Not one of the witnesses stated that Manco Capac came from Pacari Tampu, although it is difficult to imagine why they should not have done so if, as the contemporary historians believed, this was really the original Tampu Toco. The chroniclers were willing enough to accept the interesting cave near Pacari Tampu as the place where Manco Capac was born and from which he came to conquer Cusco. Why were the sworn witnesses so reticent? It seems hardly possible that they should have forgotten where Tampu Toco was supposed to have been. Was their reticence due to the fact that its actual whereabouts had been successfully kept secret? Manco Capac's home was that Tampu Toco to which the followers of Pachacuti VI fled with his body after the overthrow of the old regime, a very secluded and holy place. Did they know it was in the same fastnesses of the Andes to which in the days of Pizarro the young Incumanco had fled from Cusco? Was this the cause of their reticence? Certainly the requirements of Tampu Toco are met at Machu Picchu. The splendid natural defenses of the Grand Canyon of the Urubamba made it an ideal refuge for the descendants of the Amautas during the centuries of lawlessness and confusion which succeeded the barbarian invasion from the plains of the east and south. The scarcity of violent earthquakes and also its healthfulness, both marked characteristics of Tampu Toco, are met at Machu Picchu. It is worth noting that the existence of Machu Picchu might easily have been concealed from the common people. At the time of the Spanish conquest, its location might have been known only to the Inca and his priests. So, notwithstanding the belief of the historians, I feel it is reasonable to conclude that the first name of the ruins of Machu Picchu was Tampu Toco. Here Pachacuti VI was buried. Here was the capital of the little kingdom where during centuries between the Amautas and the Incas there was kept alive the wisdom, skill and best traditions of the ancient folk who had developed the civilization of Peru. It is well to remember that the defenses of Cusco were of little avail before the onslaught of the warlike invaders. The great organization of farmers and masons, so successful in its ability to perform mighty feats of engineering with primitive tools of wood, stone and bronze, had crumbled away before the attacks of savage hordes who knew little of the arts of peace. The defeated leaders had to choose a region where they might live in safety from their fierce environs Furthermore, in the environs of Machu Picchu they found every variety of climate. Valleys so low as to produce the precious coca, yuca and plantain, the fruits and vegetables of the tropics. 
slopes high enough to be suitable for many varieties of maize, quinoa and other cereals as well as their favorite root crops including both sweet and white potatoes, uka, anju and uluku. Here, within a few hours journey, they could find days warm enough to dry and cure the coca leaves, nights cold enough to freeze potatoes in the approved aboriginal fashion. Although the amount of arable land which could be made available with the most careful terracing was not large enough to support a very great population, Machu Picchu offered an impregnable citadel to the chiefs and priests and their handful of followers who were obliged to flee from the rich plains near Cusco and the broad pleasant valleys of Yucay. Only dire necessity and terror could have forced the people which had reached such a stage of engineering, architecture and agriculture to leave hospitable valleys and tablelands for rugged canyons. Certainly there is no part of the Andes less fitted by nature to meet the requirements of an agricultural folk unless their chief need was a safe refuge and retreat. Here the wise remnant of the Amautas ultimately developed great ability. In the face of tremendous natural obstacles, they utilized their ancient craft to wrest a living from the soil. Hemmed in between the savages of the Amazon jungles below and their enemies on the plateau above, they must have carried on border warfare for generations. Aided by the temperate climate in which they lived and the ability to secure a wide variety of food within a few hours climb up or down from their towns and cities, they became hardy, vigorous tribe which in the course of time burst its boundaries, fought its way back to the rich Cusco Valley, overthrew the descendants of the ancient invaders and established, with Cusco as a capital, the empire of the Incas. After the first Inca, Manco Capac, had established himself in Cusco, what more natural than that he should have built a fine temple in honor of his ancestors. Ancestor worship was common to the Incas, and nothing would have been more reasonable than the construction of the Temple of the Three Windows. As the Incas grew in power and extended their rule over the ancient empire of the Cusco Amautas, from whom they traced their descendant, superstitious regard would have led them to establish their chief temples and palaces in the city of Cusco itself. There was no longer any necessity to maintain the citadel of Tamputoco. It was probably deserted while Cusco grew and the Inca Empire flourished. As the Incas increased in power, they invented various myths to account for their origin. One of these traced their ancestry to the islands of Lake Titicaca. Finally, the very location of Manco Capac's birthplace was forgotten by the common people, although undoubtedly known to the priests and those who preserved the most sacred secrets of the Incas. Then came Pizarro and the bigoted conquistadors. The native chiefs faced the necessity of saving whatever was possible of the ancient religion. The Spaniards coveted gold and silver. The most precious possessions of the Incas, however, were not images and utensils, but the sacred virgins of the sun, who, like the Vestal virgins of Rome, were from their earliest childhood trained to service of the great sun god, looked at from the standpoint of an agricultural people who needed the sun to bring their food crops to fruition and keep them from hunger, it was, it was of the utmost importance to placate him with sacrifices and secure the good effects of his smiling face. If he delayed his coming or kept himself hidden behind the clouds, the maize would mildew and the ears would not properly ripen. If he did not shine with the accustomed brightness after the harvest, the ears of corn could not be properly dried and kept over to the next year. In short, any unusual behavior on the part of the sun meant hunger and famine. Consequently, their most beautiful daughters were consecrated to his service as virgins who lived in the temple and ministered to the wants of priests and rulers. Human sacrifice had long since been given up in Peru and its place taken by the consecration of these damsels. Some of the virgins of the sun in Cusco were captured Others escaped and accompanied Manco into the inaccessible canyons of Wilcapampa. It will be remembered that Father Calancha relates the trials of the first two missionaries in this region, who 
who at the peril of their lives urged the Inca to let them visit the University of Idolatry at Vilcabamba Viejo, the largest city in the province, Machu Picchu admirably answers its requirements. Here it would have been very easy for the Inca Titu Cusi to have kept the monks in the vicinity of the sacred city for three weeks without their catching a single glimpse of its unique temples and remarkable palaces. It would have been possible for Titu Cusi to bring Friar Marcos and Friar Diego to the village of Intihuatana near San Miguel at the foot of Machu Picchu cliffs. The sugar planters of the lower Urubamba valley crossed the bridge of San Miguel annually for 20 years in blissful ignorance of what lay on top of the ridge above them. So the friars might easily have been lodged in huts at the foot of the mountain without their being aware of the extent and importance of the Inca University. Apparently, they returned to Pucuyura with so little knowledge of the architectural character of Vilcabamba Viejo that no description of it could be given their friends, eventually to be reported by Calancha. Furthermore, the difficult journey across country from Pucuyura might easily have taken three days. Finally, it appears from Dr. Eaton's studies that the last residents of Machu Picchu itself were mostly women. In the burial caves, which we have found in the region round about Machu Picchu, the large proportions of skulls belonging to men is very large. There are many so-called quote-unquote tree pant skulls. Some of them seem to belong to soldiers injured in war by having their skulls crushed in, either with clubs or the favorite sling stones of the Incas. In no case have we found more than 25 skulls without encountering some quote-unquote tree pant specimens among them. In striking contrast is the result of excavations at Machu Picchu where 164 skulls were found in the burial caves, yet none of them had been quote-unquote tree panned. Of the 135 skeletons whose sex could be accurately determined by Dr. Eaton, 109 were females. Furthermore, it was in the graves of the females that the finest artifacts were found, showing that they were persons of no little importance. Not a single representative of the robust male of the warrior type was found in the burial caves of Machu Picchu. Another striking fact brought out by Dr. Eaton is that some of the female skeletons represent individuals from the sea coast. This fits in with Kalancha's statement that Titu Kusi tempted the monks not only with beautiful women of the highlands, but also with those who came from the tribes of the Yungas or warm valleys. The warm valleys may be those of the rubber country, but Sir Clemens Markham thought the oasis of the coast were meant. Furthermore, as Mr. Safford has pointed out, among the artifacts discovered at Machu Picchu was a snuffing tube intended for the use with the narcotic stuff which was employed by the priests and necromancers to induce a hypnotic state. This powder was made from the seeds of the tree which the Incas called Huilca or Wilca, which, as has been pointed out in chapter 6, grows near these ruins. This seems to me to furnish additional evidence of the identity of Machu Picchu with Calancha's Vilcabamba. It cannot be denied that the ruins of Machu Picchu satisfy the requirements of, quote, the largest city in which was the University of Idolatry, end quote, until someone can find the ruins of another important place with three days journey of Pucuyura, which was an important religious center and whose skeletal remains are chiefly those of women. I am inclined to believe that this was the Vilcabamba Viejo of Calancha, just as Espiritu Pampa was the Vilcabamba Viejo of Ucampo. In the interesting account of the last Incas, purporting to be by Titu Cusi, but actually written in excellent Spanish by Friar Marcos. He says that his father, Manco, fleeing from Cusco, went first to, quote, Vilcabamba, the head of all the province. In the Anales del Peru, Montesinos says that Francisco Pizarro, thinking that the Inca Manco wished to make peace with him, tried to please the Inca, by sending him a present of a very fine pony and a mulatto to take care of it. In place of rewarding the messenger, 
the Inca killed both man and beast. When Pizarro was informed of this, he took revenge on Manku by cruelly abusing the Inca's favorite wife and putting her to death. She begged of her attendants that, quote, when she should be dead, they would put her remains in a basket and let it float down the Yukai or Urubamba river that the current might take it to her husband, the Inca, end quote. She must have believed that at that time Manku was near this river. Machu Picchu is on its bank. Espiritu Pampa is not. We have already seen how Manku finally established himself at Huiticos, where he restored in some degree the fortunes of his house. Surrounded by fertile valleys, not too far removed from the great highway which the Spaniards were obliged to use in passing from Lima to Cusco, he could readily attack them. At Machu Picchu, he would not have been so conveniently located for robbing the Spanish caravans, nor for supplying his followers with arable lands. There is abundant archaeological evidence that the citadel of Machu Picchu was at one time occupied by the Incas and partly built by them on the ruins of a far older city. Much of the pottery is unquestionably the so-called Cusco style used by the last Incas. The more recent buildings resemble those structures on the island of Titicaca said to have been built by the later Incas. They also resemble the fortress of Huiticos at Rosapata built by Manku about 1537. Furthermore, they are by far the largest and finest ruins in the mountains of the old province of Vilcabamba and represent the place which would naturally be spoken of by Titicusi as the, quote, head of the province, end quote. Espiritu Pampa does not satisfy the demands of a place which was so important as to give its name to the entire province to be referred to as, quote, the largest city, end quote. It seems quite possible that the inaccessible forgotten citadel of Machu Picchu was the place chosen by Manku as the safest refuge for those versions of the sun who had successfully escaped from Cusco in the days of Pizarro. For them and their attendants, Manku probably built many of the newer buildings and repaired some of the older ones. Here they lived out their days secure in the knowledge that no Indians would ever breathe to tell the conquistadors the secret of their sacred refuge. When the worship of the sun actually ceased on the heights of Machu Picchu, no one can tell. That the secret of its existence was so well kept is one of the marvels of Andean history. Unless one accepts the theories of its identity with Tamputoco and Vilcabamba Viejo, there is no clear reference to Machu Picchu until 1875, when Charles Wiener heard about it. Someday we may be able to find a reference in one of the documents of the 16th or 17th centuries, which will indicate that the energetic Viceroy Toledo, or a contemporary of his, knew of this marvelous citadel and visited it. Writers like Ciesa de Leon and Pulo de Undegardo, who were assiduous in collecting information about all the holy places of the Incas, give the names of many places which as yet we have not been able to identify. Among them we may finally recognize the temples of Machu Picchu. On the other hand, it seems likely that if any of the Spanish soldiers, priests or other chroniclers had seen this citadel, they would have described its chief edifices in unmistakable terms. Until further light can be thrown on this fascinating problem, it seems reasonable to conclude that, at Machu Picchu, we have the ruins of Tampu Toco, the birthplace of the first Inca, Manco Capac, and also the ruins of a sacred city of the last Incas. Surely this granite citadel, which has made such a strong appeal to us on account of its striking beauty and the indescribable charm of its surroundings, appears to have had a most interesting history. Selected about 800 AD as the safest place of refuge for the last remnants of the old regime fleeing from southern invaders, it became the site of the capital of a new kingdom and gave birth to the most remarkable family which South America has ever seen. Abandoned about 1300 when Cusco once more flashed into glory as the capital of the Peruvian Empire, it seems to have been again sought out in time of trouble 
when in 1534 another foreign invader arrived, this time from Europe, with a burning desire to extinguish all vestiges of the ancient religion. In its last state it became the home and refuge of the virgins of the sun, priestesses of the most humane cult of Aboriginal America. Here, concealed in a canyon of remarkable grandeur, protected by art and nature, these consecrated women gradually passed away, leaving no known descendants nor any records other than the masonry walls and artifacts to be described in another volume. Whoever they were, whatever name be finally assigned to these sites by future historians, of this I feel sure, that few romances can ever surpass that of the granite citadel on top of the beetling precipitous of Machu Picchu, the crown of Inca land. End quote. That is the end of the chapter.